Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello. Todd, have we um, opened up the waiting room? Yes, the room is open. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Beachy. I know these are uncertain times, and so we're glad that you carved out an hour to spend with us here at the American Cancer Society with the Comprehensive Cancer Control Initiative grant team. We are excited to have you, and we have Dr. Kazaruni on the line, and she'll get started in just a few minutes. But I wanted to let you know a couple things um, before we move forward. Um, the first is to know that you're currently on mute, and we did that on purpose. We have hundreds registered today. We want to be efficient with our time. And so we ask that if you have a question, that you type it in the chat box, and we'll make sure to get to it um, at the end of the webinar. If we don't get to your question, rest assured, we will um, hunt down Dr. Kaz and make sure that she answers your question via um, email, and we'll post all of the answers to those questions um, in a follow-up email. Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, for those of you that are joining us currently, if you would scroll down to the bottom of your screen and click on the chat box, there should be an option that says chat. That way it'll be pulled up onto your screen and you can type your name. And if you wouldn't mind also letting us know what state or tribe or territory that you're in right now, it would be wonderful to, to see where everybody's calling in from and to have that information. So how about doing that over in the chat room? And I wanted to tell you a little bit about who we are. Everyone recognizes the American Cancer Society, but you may not be as familiar with comprehensive cancer control as a term. Um, this webinar is being brought to you through a grant from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, they're a busy group right now, but they have a cancer-focused program called the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program that's actually over 20 years old. And they offer um, grant funds to the American Cancer Society to help give trainings and technical assistance to people and coalitions around the country that work on cancer in their state. So every state, tribe, and territory in the United States has a small pot of money from CDC to run a cancer coalition. And that's who this webinar is geared towards today. So if you're tuning in, it's likely that you heard about it from um, a program director or a staff member from your state's cancer coalition, and we're thrilled that you're here. As I mentioned, we are funded through the Centers for Disease Control, and super excited to have you. It has been unbelievable the, uh, the interest that we've gotten in this webinar. It's probably had the most registrations of any webinar we've given over the past two years. We're super excited. It shows that lung cancer screening is a hot topic, that you all are trying to figure out how to address it, um, not just in health systems, but as a coalition. What can you do as a group of organizations to affect lung cancer screening? For that reason, we have a three-part webinar series um, this spring, which I'll talk more about at the end of our call. But Dr. Kazaruni is with us to give us the nuts and bolts of lung cancer screening, the who, what, when, where, why we asked her to share about. She is a professor of radiology and internal medicine at the University of Michigan. And as you might guess, her research is focused on the development and the evaluation of imaging technologies that apply to the heart and lungs, including lung cancer screening, coronary artery and aortic disease, pulmonary embolism, and diffuse lung disease. So we sure she could have many stories to tell for us today of, of COVID-19, but we're asking her today to focus on lung cancer screening, and perhaps it'll be a welcome distraction for, for all of us. Um, Dr. Kazaruni is the vice chair of the NCCM Lung Cancer Screening Panel. She chairs the ACR Committee on Lung Cancer Screening and co-chairs the ACR's Lung Cancer Screening Registry. She's a busy woman, and really all of her efforts are focused on bringing quality lung cancer screening to high-risk individuals and reducing the mortality from lung cancer, which is America's number one killer. We are, I'm excited to have met Dr. Kaz through her work with the National Lung Cancer Roundtable, which we'll talk more about at the end of this, um, at the end of the broadcast. But Dr. Kaz, among all the other things I mentioned, is also um, very, uh, the inaugural chair of the roundtable. The National Lung Cancer Roundtable began a few years ago. She's lent her expertise and leadership to us um, during that time and has very graciously accepted um, the opportunity to share with us today about lung cancer screening. So Dr. Kaz, I'm gonna hand it over to you. If you wouldn't mind sharing your screen, then we will go ahead uh, with your presentation. So thank you so much for joining us. 
There we go. Thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to share my screen here and get this PowerPoint in presentation mode. It is wonderful to see all of you here on the call today, and it is a um, it is definitely a wonderful distraction, an important topic from um, what's currently going on. There we go. Okay, all set. Um, uh, I, um, I was um, really delighted to be asked to chair the National Lung Cancer Roundtable and thank Bob Smith and Rich Wender and Lauren Rosenthal, our director, for all the work um, that we've been doing over the last three years to um, reach our mission, which is to create lung cancer survivors. The reason that the roundtable uh, came to be was because of lung cancer screening and the need to development to uh, further develop, implement, and get lung cancer screening into the community to those in need across diverse populations, and to educate people on what quality lung cancer screening is. Uh, the mission of the roundtable is actually more extensive than lung cancer screening. It includes all aspects of lung cancer, um, from things that are screening related, like shared decision making and tobacco consultation and cessation in the setting of screening, to appropriate triage of people who do have lung cancer to the correct treatments, biomarker testing, uh, advanced imaging, tackling topics like lung cancer in women, and importantly, uh, a large new effort that has uh, risen around tackling stigma in all aspects of the lung cancer care continuum, which we think is so important to allow people to come forward and not feel stigmatized when seeking care, um, eliminating it to help people come forward to seek care at all and to stick with the care that they really need throughout their lung cancer journey. So I am uh, just so pleased and delighted with all the folks at the round table, all the volunteers and the people who are working on these efforts and particularly shout out to our patient advocates who are enormously significant in our work. So as we kick off this webinar series, I'm gonna tackle an overview of lung cancer screening, the who, what, when, where, and why. And I hope that you find it uh, helpful. And I, as mentioned, I'm happy to take questions either through this webinar afterwards or at my email address that you can see there. So building for success in lung cancer screening, our goal in creating lung cancer survivors through lung cancer screening is to make sure that we have safe, high quality and effective lung cancer screening practices. Um, so that we have, can meet our goals. Appropriate patient selection educa education, tobacco consultation, shared decision making, using the right imaging technique, managing abnormal screens correctly, communicating results. And the thing that I always say really helps bring this all together is through a nurse or nurse uh, practitioner, APP nurse uh, navigator or coordinator to bring the entire program together. There we go. So picture at left, early stage screen detected cancer, small lung nodule, Stage one, high cure rate. Advanced stage lung cancer, symptomatic patient, symptom detected, later stage, big, large, lobulated central mass invading structures within the middle of the chest. This is what we're trying to prevent, and this is what we're trying to find through screening. We all know that lung cancer is the biggest cancer killer in both men and women and has been for quite some time, and that the largest risk factor is cigarette smoking. It is important in the work that's ongoing that additional risk factors do get considered in identifying patients for screening, and that's work that is happening mostly in the research space at this time. It's not something that's being rolled out nationally yet based on other risk factors but I can assure you there's a lot of discussion going on about other risk factors in addition to what we're currently screening for, which is based on age and smoking history. So let's start off with who should be screened and why, what's the evidence base at a high level to support us doing it and telling us who we should be screening. And in the U.S., our lung cancer screening journey is really through the work of LCAP and the ILCAP, International Early Lung Cancer Action Program, beginning with its single thousand patients, single group uh, cohort of patients published back in 1999, 
an uh, increasingly large cohort of patients in the multiple sites that they um, co uh, coordinate services, and the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, a randomized controlled trial of over 50,000 patients in the U.S. that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's really this screening journey that has brought lung cancer screening through to um, approval and use in the United States. There are international studies which reinforce this that have come forward over the last six to eight months. The Nelson trial is a large randomized trial in Europe, a Dutch-Belgian trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in January of this year. And the MILD trial, the multicentric Italian lung detection trial, was published last summer um, in the Annals of Oncology and has 10-year follow-up on screening patients. And these two trials add a lot of data to what was known when coverage decisions were reached in the US to bring screening to patients. Key data out of the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality in patients who were screened annually for only three years. And it's important to realize that this may be the floor of the benefit of screening because it was only three years of screening. And if you were to screen four, five, six, 10, 15, 20 years in patients who are eligible, this mortality reduction would be expected to be higher. There was approximately a 7% all-cause mortality reduction, and the initial estimates were it would take screening 320 patients to screen one from a lung cancer death, but these numbers have actually come down. And the NLST followed that up with a cost-effectiveness analysis of lung, can of lung cancer screening and showed it to be highly cost-effective. In fact, it's more cost-effective than many other things that we currently screen for today. These, this information in the U.S., primarily LCAP with the beginnings and the NLST led to this uh, end of 2013 coverage decision from the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, and this is foundational in the U.S. This is the crux of how we're able to bring lung cancer screening to patients. They recommend lung cancer screening in 55 to 80 years old, 30 pack year history of smoking, either current smokers or those who've quit in the last 15 years. And that it's important to put this in context of the rest of a patient's medical conditions and comorbidities that might limit life expectancy and make screening not optimal for those patients. Because of this, private payers were required to cover lung cancer screening under the terms of the Affordable Care Act. And Medicare soon followed suit in covering lung cancer screening recommending lung cancer screening in February 2015 to similar to the, a similar population. The only difference in Medicare is the upper age where they went to 77 for coverage. There are still gaps in coverage, however, in the US, including groups such as Medicaid who are covered by Medicaid and trying to increase all states to include Medicaid covered um, individuals and lung cancer screening is an important task and other issues around independent diagnostic treatment facilities or IDTFs. There's still gaps that need to be closed, but this is what created the foundation. The Medicare coverage decision important for a large proportion of eligible individuals who are of Medicare age. Um, Medicare coverage is the 55 to 77 year olds, but otherwise is the same as the USPSTF's coverage decision. Now, a lot of what Medicare put in its coverage decision actually drives how we do screening today in the United States, and it's important to bear in mind. Now, as I mentioned earlier, are there others at similar risk for lung cancer than those who are currently covered by Medicare or private payers through the Affordable Care Act? There may be. Um, the NLST Trial-Wide Epidemiology Group has been modeling this, balancing outcome and cost. Are there other ages of patients, other smoking history? Should we be including family history, occupational exposures, radon exposures? Should we start at a younger age? Should we cover a, a, an older age individual besides what we currently know? This, these other variables are not currently covered in the U.S., but as I mentioned, they're being actively looked at. 
Do we consider emphysema and COPD? Do we consider patients with pulmonary fibrosis who are at increased risk of lung cancer? These are all things that are methodically being evaluated and could potentially impact a future USPSTF coverage decision, but the data has to be there to support it. There is one group, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, probably the, the only major professional organization that does have a recommendation for some patients outside of the USPSTF and CMS decisions. The NCCN is a not-for-profit alliance of, of the world's uh, leading cancer centers in the United States and they have a screening guideline. And as was mentioned, I'm fortunate to be the vice chair of the NCCS Lung Cancer Screening Panel. And they first say, do risk assessment. And age and smoking history, the two things that we've been talking about, are what is currently recommended by USPSTF and CMS. But they ask that you think about the other risk factors for lung cancer, radon, occupational exposure, cancer history, family history of lung cancer, disease histories like COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, and of course, in the absence of signs and symptoms of lung cancer. And based on this assessment, you can divide patients into high, moderate, or low risk. And similar to Medicare, uh, high-risk populations based on age and pack years, same recommendation are candidates for screening. The NCCN considers a slightly different group as also high risk for cancer, slightly younger age, and slightly lower pack year history if their risk of lung cancer is at least 1.3% over the, six, the next six years. In other words, they're trying to say, if you take all the other risk factors into consideration, can you identify a group that would be at an equivalent risk to those who were seen in the National Lung Screening Trial? And, and importantly, I do want to reinforce that there are coverage decisions for people who fall out of the USPSTF and the CMS guidelines. And, and that is important to consider if these criteria are to be used in practice and inform patients. Screening in, by NCCN is not recommended in moderate and low risk patients. Some important aspects of your lung cancer screening programs to make sure implemented to see that survival benefit include tobacco consultation. Smoking cessation guidance and consultation is not just a key, a key element of lung cancer screening programs because it's a good idea, but it's a teachable moment. Smoking cessation helps reduce lung cancer risk. It makes lung cancer screening more cost effective and it improves the health and reduces some of the other leading causes of death that can occur in patients at risk for lung cancer, like cardiovascular disease and COPD. There is still a large population at risk due to cigarette smoking in the United States, primarily primary cigarette smoking. It is very hard to quantify secondhand smoke exposure, which is why it's not currently something that is used to identify people to screen. If you look at the smoking history that is currently used to identify patients for screening and patient age, there's approximately 8 million people in the US that are eligible for screening in totality. There are areas of the country that have the highest concentration of cigarette smoking and not surprisingly also have the highest risk of lung cancer. And we've seen some states like Kentucky uh, implement statewide initiatives, high smoking population, high lung cancer rate, and really make a dent in uh, bringing lung cancer screening forward in a statewide level. And we've seen other states that have high lung cancer rates and high, high uh, smoking rates that have not yet done so. And we really urge that this is a, a national issue to reduce cancer mortality in general by focusing on lung cancer. Screening is an important tool to reduce lung cancer mortality if we're to make a dent in cancer nationally. And we really need to try and match the implementation efforts with the concentration of patients at risk. 
Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of people exposed to secondhand smoke, and it may be a contributor to lung cancer uh, deaths in the United States. Uh, one study estimated approximately 3,400 lung cancer deaths per year could be uh, potentially attributed to secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke exposure is declining, and the majority of the population is covered by smoke-free policies in workplaces, public areas, restaurants, and bars. It's very hard to measure secondhand smoke, which is why it is not yet a screening, uh, a factor to be used in identifying patients to screen. Um, so we recommend strongly that good tobacco cessation consultation and guidance be offered to anybody who's being considered for screening. Uh, resources that people have at their, at their um, disposal can be at their local institutions, a local clinics, hospital, health systems, or cancer centers. There are many um, government available um, initiatives, whether it's the state health department, county or city level, and chapters of national organizations like the American Lung uh, Association and the American Cancer Society have materials to help implement in lung cancer screening programs. Um, shared decision making is something unique to lung cancer screening and its implementation. And this is really a more structured way of having a conversation about risk and benefits. Um, we've talked for decades about informed decision making. Somebody's coming for surgery, they're consented for a surgery, and they're having an informed decision. But shared decision making takes it a little one step further. Shared decision making is something that is required by Medicare for lung cancer screening coverage, and it's generally a good practice. Um, a definition of shared decision making is a collaborative process that allows patients and providers to make healthcare decisions together, taking into account not only the best scientific evidence available, but patients' values and preferences. Is it right for them at this time in their life? Not just, is it right for them medically and scientifically? And it's a way of balancing and honoring provider's expert knowledge with a patient's rights to be fully informed of potential harms and benefits. And Medicare has taken this and created structure for it in coverage, in coverage for lung cancer screening. And here are some of the important elements, things that we should be talking to patients about in shared decision making. You know, what information should be made available so patients really understand that they understand it's not just a one and done test. You come in for a lung cancer screening CT and if all's good, you can walk away for three to five years. Um, making them understand that, that lung cancer screening is a program, it's a journey, it's not a one and done, and shared decision making is part of that effort. So things like, what is considered a positive screen? Um, what's the likelihood of a positive screen? And there are different content that can be used to answer these questions. In general, what is a positive screen? It's a non-calcified lung nodule on a CT that's six millimeters or larger, and it's 20 or 30 millimeters if it's a ground glass nodule. What's the likelihood of a positive screen? It's about 10% the first time somebody comes forward for a lung cancer screening CT, because there's a lot of nodules that are sitting in their lungs from all sorts of different exposures and infections over the past. But that rate will go down to maybe 4% if patients are screened the second year, the third year, and the fourth year, and so on. What's the likelihood of a positive screen being lung cancer? It's about 2 to 3%. What's the most common finding on a chest CT that could be lung cancer? It's a small lung nodule. How are positive screens usually managed? The majority of time, it's going to be a follow-up CT using the same low-dose technique as screening. But for people who have larger nodules, it could include many things ranging from bronchoscopy to PET scans to biopsy and surgery. Are there risks from lung cancer screening? 
Uh, people have talked about radiation exposure and invasive testing being risk factors, risks for people who are getting managed. The risks of both of these in context with their lung cancer risk and risk of dying from lung cancer are low. Is there information you can give to patients about invasive procedures? In the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, patients who had uh, invasive procedures performed had a low complication rate of only 1.4%. And the majority of those complications were actually in patients who had lung cancer. It was extremely low, 0.35% in the patients who were ultimately determined not to have lung cancer. If we get back to this other question about uh, findings on screening, um, what's the likelihood that clinically significant abnormalities other than lung cancer will be found? Chest CTs have been in use for about 30 to 40 years. They're used for all sorts of things from chest pain, mediastinal masses, aortic aneurysms, lung disease assessment. So we know we're going to find other things on screening CTs that could be clinically significant. In the National Lung Screening Trial, that was 7.5% of the patients in the three years of the study. There was a more recent systematic review that estimates it could be as high as 14%. It's really hard to know what the true rate is in the general population. The types of things that are being seen that can be medically significant include cardiac findings, such as moderate or severe coronary arterial calcification that can be an indicator of cardiovascular disease and need management aneurysms of the aorta that may need to be followed or potentially undergo surgical treatment, and masses, masses in other parts of the body that are seen on a chest CT. These can include masses or nodules sitting in the lower neck like the thyroid gland, sitting in the middle of the chest related to lymph nodes, sitting in the upper abdomen related to the liver, the kidneys, because those are included on the bottom few images of a lung CT scan. There's about a 0.5% extra thoracic malignancy rate from lung cancer screening CTs. Cancers like renal cell cancer and lymphoma picked up through lung cancer screening. The question comes up a lot in lung cancer screening about false positives. That is, you have an abnormal nodule on your chest CT, but it's not lung cancer. And it's because of the, the false positives that a structured reporting and management scheme was developed to help structure how we manage small nodules. In the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, 40% of subjects had at least one false positive nodule that wasn't cancer over the three years. How do we manage these? So if you're looking for some good tools for shared decision-making, this is one um, that is widely used. It's called shouldiscreen.com. And it has a shared decision-making aid as well as a risk calculator. So a patient could enter in their other clinical variables um, to try and define their individual lung cancer screening risk, which might be an important part of the conversation. There's certainly a number of good shared decision-making aids available. And I think more effective ones are in development. The Roundtable has a task group specifically looking at shared decision-making to make them easier to implement in clinical practice. And here's just a screenshot from uh, the shared decision-making aid called Should I Screen? Um, what do you screen with? Um, and this is just important to reinforce. It's a CT scan. And the CT is a low-dose CT. In my institution, we have about 30 different chest CT protocols for all sorts of different things, tailored to the aorta, tailored to the heart, tailored to the lungs, 
Those are not the protocols we want to use. We want to use a low radiation exposure chest CT known as LDCT. I put here not chest x-ray. You know, why do I feel the need, sorry, I'm moving around a little bit. Why do I feel the need to say not chest x-ray? It's because we know some people are still ordering chest x-rays to screen for lung cancer. And I want to remind people that in the 1970s, there were three large trials conducted looking at the use of chest x-ray, some with sputum cytology, that found no mortality reduction benefit from chest x-ray. So chest x-rays are not recommended to screen for lung cancer. It's a CT and it's a low dose chest CT. The next question that follows is, what do you follow up most screen detected nodules with? It's the same thing. It's a CT with low dose technique. Unless a patient has a nodule in the highest risk category of findings, and we'll talk about that briefly um, later in the webinar, most of these CTs that are done to follow up small nodules will use the same low dose CT technique. In the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, um, which began screening in 2002 and finished up its last screens in 2006, the majority of scanners used on were what we refer to as four detector scanners, these gray bars. But as the study went on, newer scanners that have been coming out called 16 or 64 detector scanners, which have higher resolution, can allow you to scan faster, which is good for people who are short of breath, and scan thinner slices, which is good for lung cancer screening, um, were included later on. In the United States today, the majority of scanners that are in use are 16 and 64 detector scanners, and some even higher than that. The CT technique for a low dose is well available. The American Association for Physicists and Medicine has reviewed the majority of CT scanners that are in the marketplace and has low dose protocols easily and freely available for any place that is, has a question about what are the best parameters to get the lowest appropriate dose. The American College of Radiology and the Society of Thoracic Radiology have a practice parameter around the specific uh, technical parameters as well. The NCCN has guidance. All of these are aligned with each other. Low-dose technique for screening CT and for the interval follow-up of the majority of screens. Just a few key factors from what does low-dose CT mean for those of you who are more technically inclined or want to go back and look at what kind of protocols are being done uh, in your area. Um, low-dose means was about one and a half millisieverts in the NLST, but it's important that we use size appropriate technique. The ACR practice parameter says under three millisieverts for an average sized person i we'll repeat that for an average size person. And the reason uh, the ACR recommends size adjusted technique is because in a small person, it takes fewer x-rays to get through the patient to create a good quality picture. And in a larger patient, just because there's more tissue to absorb those x-rays, it takes higher dose. So all the sites who are part of the lung cancer screening registry, which I'll mention a little bit later in, a, in a more detail, are required to not only report their dose, but they're required to report information on patient size. Because we want to make sure that smaller patients are getting the lower and appropriate dose for them, and larger patients are getting a more appropriate dose to their size. Size, is, size matters in lung cancer screening CT technique. The thickness of the slices that people are recommended to use is under three millimeters. Ideally, it's even about half that because you get better resolution. Some of these other variables are very technical. Low MAS means low number of x-ray exposure. Um, and there are different tools that radiologists can use like nodule detection software to help find nodules. And when they report nodules, it's recommended they report their size, where they are in the lungs, and how they look in their consistency. The key elements, one breath hold. Coaching patients to be able to hold their breath for the length of the scan, which should be about five to 10 seconds. Low radiation exposure adjusted for patient size. 
And as I mentioned, the majority of scanners in the marketplace are currently of the type that were used in the NLST or are more advanced. This is just some brief information about the American Association of Physicists and Medicine on their website. You can go to it and click on their lung cancer screening CT section and find protocols for uh, most makes and models of CT scanners being used in the US today. And they divide them um, by small, average, and large patient as the type of protocols that are out there. And they have all the major vendors listed on their site. I will say that there are advanced uh, technologies that were not available at the time that the NLST and other trials were performed that bring even lower dose potentially to the marketplace as CT scanner technology has evolved. Um, we refer to some of it as ultra low dose CT. And I just show you a picture to say how, to show you how technology is changing. So low dose CT is what we use for screening. This picture here was taken with about two millisieverts. Remember I said that about three millisieverts was necessary. This is ultra low dose CT, 0.2 millisieverts, substantially lower. Most people would say this is a prettier picture. It's a smoother picture. All the little vessels are much easier to see. People would say this is extremely grainy and question whether or not you could actually see the lung nodules they're looking for. And this is the, a lot of research is being done to see just how low can you go to minimize radiation exposure and still get a good diagnostic quality image, still find the nodules that we're looking for. Um, the NCCN has incorporated the same types of parameters into their guideline that are recommended by the ACR and the AAPM. Um, I'll skip it. So, interpreting and management of abnormalities that are found. This is really important. This is the national standard in the US um, for several reasons. When Medicare developed its coverage decision, it wanted sites to be able to use a structured reporting and management tool so that we would avoid unnecessary over-testing of people who had abnormalities, um, not wanting to do more harm by doing unnecessary tests or unnecessary biopsies. They put that in their coverage decision to use a structured management tool. The Medicare also requires any facility doing screening to participate in a CMS approved registry. The ACRs to date is the only approved registry and the registry requires you to use lung RADs. So by, if you follow those dots, CMS requires a registry. The only registry is the ACRs and the ACRs requires lung RADs. That makes this the de facto national interpretation schema for reporting lung cancer screening CT. I'm also gonna talk briefly about how to manage incidental cardiothoracic findings as well as other incidental findings through some white papers of the American College of Radiology. Um, lung RADs, uh, we developed this, and I chair the Lung RADs Committee for the ACR. We developed this, and it was first released in April 2014 in version one. It's a structured reporting and management tool. Oh, forgot my L there, sorry. And it basically allows a reader to find nodules, match them by size and their density or consistency, and from that, identify what the next management step. So it's, it's a... Um, uh, a guide to follow when reading and reporting what needs to happen next. The smaller nodules that can be considered negative screen go back to screening in 12 months. Nodules that are at slightly higher risk end up getting a follow-up CT done in six months, that interim low-dose CT scan. Nodules that are a little bit more risk get an interim CT at six months. And now just at the higher risk, go to more multidisciplinary management and additional testing. Some minor edits were made in April 2019 to reduce some of the positive screens where the rate of cancer diagnosis is extremely low. Um, I, I like to always reinforce multiple times that screening is not just a low dose lung CT scan. Um, it's a program. And 
this is no truer or more important than when people have high risk screens. That is the highest categories in lung rads known as 4B and 4X. Uh, managing positive screens and connecting the experts around how to best management is important. So multidisciplinary nodule management programs or multidisciplinary thoracic tumor boards are examples of that with folks from radiology, pulmonary medicine, thoracic surgery, and oncology and radiation oncology. And if you don't have access to a tumor board or a nodule management program, uh, try to develop the right referral source and expertise in your locale. In many places, that's pulmonary medicine. In other places, that might be thoracic surgery, depending on where the local expertise sits. And try and identify how you can refer people to programs when they're at the highest risk for management of lung cancer screening if you don't have the resource in your community. Um, people have asked, what's the proper approach to patients with a negative screen? And what we're trying to do is make sure that people with a negative screen don't think it's one and done. We want patients to come back. That's where the benefit is seen. The first screen finds, if you will, the background noise, the cancers that are there, the follow-up screens, the next annual screen, year one, year two, year three, year 10, year 20, find an incremental rate of cancers of two to 4% each year. And in order for lung cancer screening to have the benefit of reducing lung cancer mortality to maximize the benefit, we really need to keep patients coming back. We really need to reinforce that it's not licensed to uh, continue smoking or restart smoking. It's not clearance if you have a negative scan to say, oh, I'm all good. What's the likelihood a new nodule will be detected on a subsequent annual screening CT and the new nodule is cancer? Well, if you look at some data from the LCAP trial of 27,500 individuals who had a negative initial screen, the next time around, 5.3% developed a new nodule. And of those patients, 5% were cancer. So patients coming back for their second time screen, their third time screen, have a rate of developing a new nodule, and some of those nodules will be cancer. We want to make sure people come back. So having good mechanisms to reinforce that is important. The American College of Radiology has some guidance on incidental cardiothoracic findings. There are lots of other things in the chest that we've talked a little bit about that could be significant. Um, enlarged lymph nodes, masses in the chest, coronary calcium, large pulmonary arteries, a dilated or aneurysmal aorta. And this uh, guidance, which is publicly available, um, can help direct the next management step. We're trying to increase the use of these recommendations by radiologists and create increased awareness of this white paper. Preceding this white paper, the ACR has white papers on incidental findings in the liver, the kidneys, the thyroid gland, and so on to help people manage the incidental findings. Um, who should you communicate your results to? And historically, in diagnostic imaging results went back to the referring provider, whoever ordered the test. But increasingly, in diagnostic testing, and importantly in screening, communications should be going to patients directly as well. In screening mammography, that's the expectation. And not only is it the expectation, it's the law. MQSA, federal legislation, requires patients get a letter about their screening mammography. We should do the same for lung cancer screening CT results. Whether that's a letter, or in places that have electronic patient portals, electronic patient portals in their health system, communicating directly to patients is important. By communicating both to referring physicians and to patients, all of them know what the results are and what the next management steps are. This is important to make sure patients don't fall through the cracks. 
I mentioned earlier the Lung Cancer Screening Registry and uh, its relationship to Medicare is the only Medicare approved registry. And while we recognize it's a burden for sites to collect this information, it's also an important way to look at the quality of lung cancer screening and practices and for Medicare to understand screening and practice as part of their coverage decision. There, the, this is the largest registry in the history of the American College of Radiology because it is tied to coverage and it requires all patients at sites be entered to, into the registry, not just Medicare patients. And data from the registry will help us understand better how lung cancer screening is actually doing in practice across the US. Uh, we collect information on patient demographics like age, gender, we collect risk factors, primarily smoking, but we ask for additional risk factors as well. It is optional to some, at this point, but we strongly encourage other risk factors be entered in patients who don't meet screening criteria in particular if they're being screened at a site. Their smoking status, their CT results, and critically, any downstream diagnostic test results and lung cancer diagnoses over the subsequent year. We also collect information on the referring providers to understand the referral practices happening in the US, as well as as part of the CMS uh, requirements for data collection. And sites will get back reports on many of these variables. Um, they get back a report that is now electronic and online about the radiation exposure that they are delivering to patients, small, medium, and large in size, um, compared to other practices across the US so they can do quality improvement. They get information back on all of the readers at their site about their positive and negative screening categories using lung rads. Do they have over readers and under readers? Um, in the mammography world, this is a standard practice and a way to look at readers and try and understand uh, what they're calling positive screens to review cases where you have outliers and try and get everybody to be practicing at the same uh, consistent level. Um, we also look at cancer detection rate. Uh, information in the registry is also an important way of looking at access and there's some data that has been uh, matched from registry data to smoking and lung cancer rates across the country to help us understand where we need to improve access. And this one is really important and I kind of saved the best for last because how do we get all these things done in the who, what, when, where, why? Um, having access to a nurse or APP, a navigator and coordinator um, this is a like foundational glue that, that holds a program together and makes a program work. And there's evidence that's been published that having a nurse navigator or coordinator improves your screen rate and improves your follow-up rate for positive screens, as well as making sure those negative screen patients come back in a year. So we really fundamentally believe that having access to this kind of resource is important. They help with screening individuals for eligibility, making appointments for the, the screening CTs and follow-up tests, making sure the positive screens actually do get follow-up, make sure there's reminders for annual screening, um, can help collect information for uh, the database and the registry for quality improvement, can focus on education outreach, tobacco cessation, and I put at the bottom um, the human part of this, which is relationship building. We know all the scientific reasons why we screen and how we screen and what we need to take into consideration, but like anything, that human touch, that relationship building with patients coming forward to screening and having a resource, somebody that has their back and can uh, continually help them and connect them is really, really important. Relationship building. So hats off to any of those, any of you who are on this webinar today who are nurse navigators or coordinators. Um, we salute you and, and believe you're fundamental. Um, this reminds me that the uh, National Lung Cancer Roundtable is currently working on a business model plan that 
uh, practices hospitals facilities can use to enter in information enter in information about their area their their facilities their practice their number of patients and from that it will uh, derive for you what kind of resources do you need as well as um, calculate the a return on investment, if you will, that could, will, that could be used with a hospital administrator or facility administrator to make the case for getting the kind of resources you need, such as to be able to get a nurse navigator or coordinator for a lung cancer screening program. And it's also working on a second component, which is for sites that are working on managing lung nodules found in other ways. As I mentioned, chest CTs are done for lots of reasons and find lots of nodules. So incidental nodule management as well as part of that business model program that we're developing. And we think sites will find that to be very uh, useful in trying to secure resources by helping build the return on investment um, to get the resource. So I like to remind everybody that it's still early in lung cancer screening implementation compared to the several decades of uh, colon cancer screening and breast cancer screening. Uh, we have a lot to do in awareness and education among patients and providers. We're not at the level of understanding of uh, awareness and necessity that breast cancer screening and colon cancer screening is at. We have the lovely pink month of uh, breast cancer awareness that permeates everything from the soccer socks my kids wear on the field in the month of October that are bright pink to, uh, to uh, NFL football players. Um, we have a lot of awareness around colon cancer. And I say this with both sadness and hope that the, the, the lung cancer ribbon is kind of a pearly white um, and has lots of opportunity to be etched in and filled in um, as we move lung cancer screening forward in the US. And lastly, I wanna thank all of you for helping to create lung cancer survivors to lower the impact of lung cancer through prevention, early detection, detection and insurance of optimal therapy for those who were diagnosed, to do so in a patient-centered, evidence-based manner that's inclusive, diverse, proactive, and visionary as our goal. Uh, together, we, we can create lung can cancer survivors and we can reduce lung cancer stigma across the entire continuum of lung cancer care towards this goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kazaruni. Uh, this is Katie. We appreciate you taking the time to share with us today. And we have several questions um, that have come up throughout the talk in the chat box. And we'll do our best to keep everybody on time. Um, we know there's places to go and people to see. But my colleague, uh, Sarah Schaefer, who is the Managing Director for National Partnerships and Innovation here at the American Cancer Society, has been watching the chat box for us and has some questions for you. So if you wouldn't mind, Sarah, let us know what some of those burning questions are. Sure, thank you. Hi, Dr. Kazaruni. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. It was very informative and tons of kudos popping up in the chat uh, for the information you just uh, relayed to all of us. And just for everybody to know, um, the slides and a recording of the web webinar will be made available after our session today. So look for that from, from Katie Beji and Todd Tyler. Um, so Dr. Kazaruni, um, the first question that we have in the chat, and I'm just gonna take them in order, we will do as many as we can until Katie signals to me to stop so that she can wrap up and get everybody done on time. But the first question is, if someone stopped smoking 20 years ago, but still fits all the other guidelines, do they qualify to get screening? So currently, um, under the USPSTF decision, which impacts private, pay private payers, and the Medicare coverage decision, which affects Medicare beneficiaries, that person would not qualify for lung cancer screening. There are still programs that may consider evaluating a person like that. So for example, in our place, somebody who doesn't meet the accepted criteria, um, we have a wonderful pulmonary medicine physician and clinic program that will review the lung cancer risk about with a person. Maybe they have other risk factors. Um, and if, if through that shared decision-making discussion risk assessment they want to move forward, we will accept referrals through that program only. Um, and it, there, there may be opportunities for others to do that. There are, of course, implications for coverage because uh, payers will likely not cover it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our second question is, are you able to successfully reimburse 
for tobacco counseling? I, that would be a hard question for me to answer. We are here at our institution, but I think this is probably a, a much bigger question than I would have the expertise to be able to answer. Great. We will, uh, for everybody, questions that we don't get to or we want to defer, we will include those in a, in a follow-up to everybody who's attended the webinar. Um, our next question, does your institution turn patients away if they do not meet the criteria? Yeah, I think I just covered that in saying yeah. we, uh, if we, if they, if they're, a screening is ordered and we see they don't meet criteria, we will go through our multidisciplinary pulmonary clinic and they will um, see patients and discuss that. Okay. Sarah, next before question. you go on to the next question, um, I'm going to ask Todd while we're um, continuing the Q&A to pull up the poll so that people can be multitasking and um, filling out our polls so that we can accurately evaluate our webinar and, and keep on doing what we're doing. So Todd, if you don't mind pulling it up, and as you're answering questions, please make sure you scroll down. Um, there's probably about eight or eight questions. Um, there, just click, click and send, and um, we'd really appreciate your feedback as we keep going here with questions. And perhaps Dr. Kaz, you could stop sharing your screen. That might help Todd as he uh, pulls up. There we go. I'm gonna move over here and I'll find the stop share button. Okay, just clicked Thanks. it. Thanks, and, and Sarah, go ahead. Okay. So our next question is, um, should this be done annually if they have a low LRAD category? Um, can you repeat the question? Um, it might be a little out of context. It might have been put up during one of your earlier slides. Should this be done annually if they have a low LRAD category? Uh, I think I understand. So yeah. a negative screen is considered a lung RADS 1, which is basically no nodules at all. And it also includes lung RADS2, which is small nodules, which have a very, very low likelihood of becoming significant cancer over the next year. So lung RAD1 and 2 are both considered negative screens. And if those are the categories, they return to annual screening in 12 months. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, uh, and we're looking for clarification regarding shared decision making. Should be used with eligible Medicare patients, not for any Medicare patient who thinks they might warrant screening. So a Medicare beneficiary who meets those criteria may be screened and should uh, discuss this with their primary care physician. Okay. I'm saying providers, please make sure the um, if other factors cause a positive screen like nodules, is a biopsy ordered to confirm? So it depends on the size of the nodule and the risk of cancer. So in general, the larger the nodule, the higher risk. There are other features on a chest CT about that nodule that might make it even higher risk, like it's got jaggedy spiculated borders instead of being nice and smooth. Um, additional testing, such as a PET scan, is often useful. Uh, sometimes you can have irregular, jagged-looking nodules that are related to scar that's been sitting there for a long time. And so a PET scan is something that may, um, PET scan or PET CT as it's often known, um, is a test that is often used to, uh, to evaluate patients who are at the highest risk of cancer. And then if appropriate, um, there might be other findings on the chest CT, for example, you could have a pleural effusion or enlarged lymph nodes, other things that might make you make a, a person at even higher risk than just the nodule itself. And that's the kind of thing that gets discussed in a, in a multidisciplinary program or with a specialist who can pull all those things together, look at risk, and then decide if a biopsy is necessary. And those biopsies can either be done, um, say, through a bron uh, bronchoscopy where a tube is put down the airway. Sometimes they can be done under um, CT scanner guidance where a needle is, goes um, into the chest between the ribs to take a sample of, of a nodule. Um, and sometimes it might need to be done um, surgically, all depending on what the findings are for an individual patient. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I think um, we're going to start to wrap things up um, with Dr. Kazaruni, but please continue to answer the poll questions if you're able. Uh, we so appreciate your feedback. It's really important to us. And I wanted to point out two resources before we let you go, and I'll make sure to email these to you. Um, the Lung Cancer Atlas is something that Dr. Kazaruni and other folks at the National Lung Cancer Roundtable and, and the American Cancer Society have been working for a long time to get out there for you all. 
and it offers an interactive geographic view of data that has to do with lung cancer in the U.S. So if you're wondering what's happening in your state, tribe, or territory, and you're trying to identify areas for intervention as a coalition, this is a great place to start. Um, be on the lookout for a, kind of a how-to webinar on how to use this this summer. So um, we'll be excited to share that with you. Um, the other uh, resource I wanted to highlight is CDC, about two or three years ago, put out a, uh, a guide called Policies and Practices for Cancer Prevention. And it's specifically for comprehensive cancer control coalitions like those that we hope are tuned in today to figure out what they can do as a coalition um, around lung cancer screening programs and people that are high risk for lung cancer. So um, just a, in summary, I want to thank Dr. Kazaruni for all um, the hard work that went into this presentation. It's such a ridiculously busy time for folks like yourself in the, in the health field and in public health. I can't tell you how much um, we appreciate that and you making yourself available for us. Um, so we do have our next webinar in the series coming up on April 29th from one to two with Dr. Mayfield, who is from the Georgia um, Lung Cancer Roundtable. He also works with Wellstar Health System as a physician. And he's gonna talk to us a little bit about, do we know what is working? You know, What interventions out there are increasing lung cancer screening in eligible adults? And how might a state coalition do something about it? So make sure to tune in for that. And then our final webinar in the series will be due June 3rd. Um, with Dr. Favi. So we are so thankful to you all for tuning in from us today. Thank you, Dr. Kaz. And we, in the next few days, we'll get these resources out and available to you all. And have a wonderful day and stay healthy, everyone. Bye-bye.